And it is the top of the it is the top of the hour and we're happy to welcome you to the seventh annual Global Education Conference. And I'm not sure what keynote we are on right now, but we're we're probably on our seventh keynote of the conference as well. And we're very thrilled to uh, to present a woman who's been a long time supporter of the Global Education Conference. I first met her, BHA, in uh, our conference room and she's been an active participant in sessions before. And I had the pleasure of meeting her in person at the Global Education Forum that took place in Philadelphia about a month ago. Um, the Global Education Forum is a face-to-face -face conference that's put on by um, a number of people, including the Asia Society and VIF International Education and other groups that have been supportive of us. And uh, it was it's even better uh, uh, to connect, face, you know, in person to people. Um, after meeting them virtually. So it was a real treat to meet you, Ute. And she is a Catholic school principal in Los Angeles. And I was intrigued by her stories of, of how she's taking her school global and her plans for the future of her school and that sort of thing. So I thought from an administrator's perspective that she would be particularly uh, relevant uh, to our audience. So um, I hope you will enjoy this talk. Before we get officially going, I want to make sure that we thank our sponsors, uh, VIF International Education, Google for Education, TEZ, IRN USA, and numerous others who have supported us. We also want to make sure that you all know about a game that we have going um, through Chrome Warrior. And the, the website is gec.chromewarrior.net. And it is a professional development uh, gamified experience so that you can make the most of the conference and our resources. We will be uh, awarding um, badges or badges and certificates for participation if you get 300 points in that game. So I'll put the link in the chat later on, but I want to make sure that you know about Chrome Warrior and how they're helping support uh, adult learning at this conference. It's, it's pretty fun. I think you guys will really enjoy it. Um, so thank you to everyone who's made this happen. We really appreciate it. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to enable everybody's whiteboard permissions. And you're going to take the tool to the left-hand side of the whiteboard and click, double-click on the star and, uh, and then, or click one and then click on where you are in the map. And you can also tell us in the chat where you, where you are specifically right now. I'm in Northbrook, Illinois. Um, and hopefully I have the chat enabled too, if I do. Uh, I'm in Northbrook, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And the weather is overcast and chilly. It is autumn here in the Midwest part of the United States. So it looks like we've got people from uh, North Carolina, Canada, British Columbia in Canada and Ontario in Canada. Anyone else? Anybody else awake in another part of the world? Anderson, Indiana, just northeast of Indianapolis. Yes, I think I've driven through there. California, New York City. And here we have Hella, who's from Tunisia. Australia, it must be definitely early in Australia. Nepal, we have Govinda from Nepal. We have Jeannie in Mexico. This is exciting. We need to get some countries in here between Australia and the United States, don't we, and Canada. Look at that. There's a, kind of like a diagonal line going through the map. Um, anyway, we're so happy to have you here, everyone. And I know you're going to really enjoy this talk. And I don't want to talk further because uh, you've heard enough from me, I'm sure. So thank you for coming, everyone. If you have any questions, put them in the chat, and we'll keep track of them uh, for BHK, and uh, we'll get going right now. So I'm going to turn this over to you. And without further ado, thank you for coming, BHK. Thank you so much. I, I want to thank uh, both Lucy and Steve for all that they're doing to try and get our uh, global educators connected virtually. So. Uh, Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. I am I am thrilled and somewhat intimidated by the <laughs> by the numbers and also by the audience that I have. So 
I, I welcome you. I hope I can uh, make this a valuable contribution and use of your time. And uh, just the mere fact that we are connected globally here uh, to talk about a very important topic is something that um, that is meaningful. So this session is uh, twofold. I have to confess that when I first started to think about the topic and the presentation, um, things have changed quite a bit since um, I submitted my proposal. And as you can imagine, uh, the uh, uh, geopolitical impact has been felt on, on this particular presentation. So I will try to share my journey, but also I want to use this as a time for reflection um, because I think sometimes that is what is most uh, useful. So again, I welcome you to this session that is entitled Urgent Action and Critical Lens. I know that um, the fact that you are here, it means that you do recognize an urgency in global education. Um, you would not be spending your time here if that was not the case. However, given the events of the last week and the implications thereof, I have no um, premonition of how this was going to really change the entire presentation as well. Um, the question, of course, is do you advocate for your students to become globally competent? And I think uh, for us, there are a number of things we need to take into consideration, and I will go into the various points. And um, sometimes it does feel as though we are very lonely in the work that we are doing. And I'm um, speaking from my personal perspective. Now, I realize that some of you may be in charter schools, public schools, faith-based organizations. Um, you may be in international schools who have tremendous resources and opportunities. So I realize that we come from different backgrounds, uh, but this particular journey is taken as uh, a school um, that has recognized global competency as one of its focal points for the future. Today's objective then is to infuse some courage in, if, in case you feel like a lonely warrior to infuse some courage and to think outside of the box. Um, when we look at the research uh, with regards to international education, international schools, how global education came about, how multicultural education came about, we realize that there are multiple formulas and multiple paths to global education. Uh, we are also going to consider various perspectives, our environment, and to see what is happening where we are at this point in time. And finally, we're going to ask a few very important questions um, from a critical perspective, because there are certain things that we really need to uh, take into, um, into account. And I just realized that uh, I hope my pictures are moving as we, as we go about. Um, so with regards to the, the courage, I, I believe that we need to uh, start this journey by really uh, identifying our self-worth and the self-worth of our students, that we must be able to, um, I'm sorry, uh, Lucy, can you just verify whether you can see the slides that I'm moving? Yeah, we can see the I'm courage. Sorry. I just hope you can see courage. Okay, it says courage. Is that correct? I just want to make sure that it's moving because oh, it's showing it is me moving. something We're different here. Oh, it's moving. We're seeing Okay, good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the interruption. So the, the, the thing about the courage is that we need to understand that um, each one of us has uh, that humanity within us, and that uh, this is something that is relevant, that we have our identity and our self-worth, regardless of where we are from or where we are going, what our experiences are, and what we have shared so far. Um, courage also requires a certain amount of humility, and um, 
that is because we are lifelong learners. We continue to um, learn from each other. And it really does not matter what system or location we are in, uh, what our experiences previously have been. Uh, some of the most important moments are at the present if we are uh, to learn as a lifelong learner. Finally, courage involves applied skills to know oneself, to know one's strength, and one's areas of growth as well. So for us as educators, sometimes we must take a calculated risk. We must take um, all the energy that we have and all the knowledge that we have and move forward if we want to make sure that we can uh, advance. For us, what did it mean in terms of our particular situation? Uh, we need to really take inventory of our assets. And I say assets in, in, in a um, careful manner because we are talking about human beings. We are talking about um, uh, an inventory of, of value that is simply amazing. Uh, when we look at our community, we have to understand where we are and who our community is. Um, we need to understand what knowledge bases there are present. And this is uh, when you research um, more about this is to understand that there are different, not just different perspectives, but different experiences that have uh, culminated in the knowledge within your community and that that needs to be given voice. Um, we have to look at the diversity and understand not just the socioeconomic diversity, but also the racial diversity and ethnic diversity, national diversity. Um, these are all very important factors. We need to maintain a certain um, authenticity. We are not going to have the same formula for success for each school around the world, meaning that there is not one size that fits all. Each one of us will have to really determine our starting point, and that's what I mean by assets. So the authenticity for each school to really figure out who we are is very, very important. And then we must be agile. And that is of utmost importance at this time, um, looking at the, at the political climate that we have experienced here in the last uh, week in, in the United States. And actually, it's been 500 days of campaigning, so it's been a little bit longer than that. But um, these are all important factors. When we look at the demographics, who do we serve, Where, um, who are our students? Because certainly what we want to do as an educator, as a global educator, is to be student-centered in our decision making. Uh, we need to really think about what it means to give our students a global education. Um, what are the backgrounds? What are the starting points we just talked about? We also need to understand the systems. We have schools that are part of different systems. In our particular case, it is the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. We have about 200, uh, over 200 schools in just the elementary setting. And um, that is something that uh, helps us. It helps us as a school here at St. Augustine, but it also helps us in terms of a learning community and a, a professional learning uh, community. So to see what the system is that we are working in. And then ob obviously the social norms. Um, and in our particular case, one of those social norms is that we are uh, a faith-based institution. We have our mission statement. Uh, we have a certain story to tell. And uh, as, as educators, we realize that parents have options. We realize that parents are the primary educator. And uh, we need to understand that we are serving a specific need for our students. We need to also keep in mind the various perspectives that are happening. Um, and one of them is uh, the cultural perspective, the cultural identity. Um, the other one is the economic system in which we are functioning. 
Um, also, we need to look at the leadership within our um, within our given system, and that means that uh, we have um, to understand what kind of leadership do we endorse, what kind of leadership, what kind of leadership do we want to uh, practice ourselves, but also what kind of leadership are we surrounded? Is it a traditional system? Is it a leadership for a stewardship? Is it a servant leadership? So the different leadership styles have an impact as well. We already talked about the stakeholders and specifically if we want to um, see who we are serving, we need to understand what impacts us. Um, who are we um, working with? The business community, the families, the students, the faculty and the teachers, the, the staff, a hugely important factor. And so we had to analyze all of this and it took us quite some time to really understand who we are. Um, We, and we also understood that without a, a plan or a vision, we could not advance. So for us, what was very important is, um, as a school, we had to look at our mission statement. And uh, our school has just celebrated 90 years. So 90, 90 is quite a long time to be existing in, um, as a school here in Los Angeles. And uh, that is a tradition and that is a heritage that we have. But it can also um, become what I call a Velcro effect, which is uh, Velcro that is really hard to move and to change and to, uh, it, because it's so attached to its history. Um, we as a school had to go back and look at our history, our initial mission statement and um, ask ourselves, why are we here? What is it that we as a Catholic school are doing or need to be doing at this time? So this is what shaped our vision, and then we have to come up with a strategy. Now, as a school, um, specifically, we were very fortunate. We had a number of uh, opportunities um, I have had. Uh, the chance to come to one of the uh, the conferences that we had in Philadelphia, as uh, Lucy had mentioned before, um, I was able to connect with international and, and global educators there. Um, I have had an opportunity to work with the I3 Institute here in Los Angeles, which is through the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. We had a number of uh, wonderful support systems from various universities from very knowledgeable mentors, and so a lot of the footwork was done by us as a staff, as an administrator, and as a faculty. Um, we have always involved the parents in the process. We have always involved the students in the process. And that is something that goes back to the stakeholders. Who are we as a community? If we don't have the buy-in, if we don't have that solid foundation that this is an urgent need for our students. It doesn't matter how good our research is and it doesn't matter how good our vision or our strategy is. The foundation for this is know thyself, know thy community, and, and really work together uh, in, in defining this. Um, we also have to look at some strategies and ask ourselves what are we already providing that are some of the assets and what do we need to do? So for us, it meant that we actually um, integrated a couple of electives. Um, first of all, our students uh, had the opportunity to um, study Spanish, which is very important here in Los Angeles and in California. So all students from preschool, age two, all the way to eighth grade are uh, partaking in this. Um, and then also for our junior high students, we happen to have the resources to offer both French as a world language and Arabic as a world language. Now, our students are not going to become translators, simultaneous translators at the United Nations. Uh, we just don't have the resources to give them that kind of intensive knowledge. 
but we are opening their horizons. We're giving them an exposure and an opportunity and a different perspective about world cultures and world languages. And we're giving them an opportunity to dream big and to explore and to have that critical lens for the future. <clears throat> So again, what, what uh, perspectives do we need to consider? Obviously, this is all student-centered. It is very important that we keep in mind all the decisions that we are making are about our students. Um, if we deviate from that, we are not addressing some of the critical issues we are facing in our education system. We also need to be aware that probably the best tool that we have as educators um, is the knowledge that our faculty has, the professionalism that our faculty and staff have. Uh, the teacher, the mentor, um, the, the guide within the instruction is the most valuable tool. Obviously, technology has a lot to do with our learning tools and uh, virtual as well as uh, uh, physical. Um, it's important that we integrate technology, but at the end of the day, what we as a human being have to contribute is very, very valuable and very essential. The parents are still considered the primary educators. It doesn't matter if their perspectives are conflicting with ours. It doesn't matter if they have um, a certain uh, opinion. Uh, we can work together. We can bring them into this equation and um, uh, really make sure that this is, is something that is a, co a collaboration between the various parties. Uh, the community at, l at large, we have worked very hard with our business community. And I know that from a critical lens and perspective, sometimes that is um, something that is either encouraged or discouraged. Um, for us, the business community here locally is very important if we look at um, our city, there has been a demographic movement into the city. Um, there is a change in terms of the jobs and the professions that are uh, that are being sought. Um, there is um, a lot of opportunity that is arising. And so if we as a school stay isolated, we cannot function. We cannot read the temperature. Uh, that is out there, and I'm not talking about um, <laughs> uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, we cannot uh, gauge the climate of the business community. And we need that knowledge. We need that input. We need that collaboration to be aware of what is going on in our local world, but also in our larger community. I mentioned the leadership uh, that is important both in the system level as well as the local level. and um, the system itself. The critical lens, this is probably where um, we really need to reflect and ask ourselves, what is it that we want to achieve? For us here at our school, we are dealing with very young students. We have students who are as young as 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus, 5 plus. That's our early childhood education. And then we have our students who are going from first grade all the way to junior high school. So when they leave our school, they're actually entering high school in the US system. Um, what is it that we want to achieve? We really ask ourselves that question. And how do we define global competency? If you do some research about that, uh, global education as such has had numerous definitions. Um, there is a perspective from a UK where it's called a global dimension. If you look at Australia, there is integration of global education within their framework, their national framework. Um, if you look at uh, Kenya, Kenya even has uh, in its uh, vision, vision 2030, a statement there about what they what they are envisioning for education. And so um, we need to define what that means at our level, but also connect it to the greater picture, to the bigger picture um, of other global educators. And that's where collaboration, such as the 
the conference, <coughs> excuse me, the conference we're having here is very, very important. Um, if we don't connect, we don't know what's going on in the world. If we don't stay uh, in tune and exchange perspective uh, respectfully, um, if we don't make that effort to know and to gain that knowledge from each other uh, and to share the knowledge from each other, then um, we have a, an opportunity to be very localized and we may call ourselves globally competent, but uh, we may not be uh, such. Um, at what stage do our students become globally competent? Can I ask someone in preschool, preschool to be globally competent? No, I can't. The reality is um, at that point a, a young student is developing his or her um, uh, identity. Uh, they are learning about themselves. Uh, their developmental stages impact their, their um, uh, their ability to process information, so we are not going to talk about global competency at the preschool level. But we are going to talk about respect. We are going to talk about uh, respect for opinions, uh, exchanging, um, learning in a, in a social, emotional way that is important and that is the foundation. So when they come to first grade, when they come to a higher level uh, of thinking, that they already have that foundation that they understand we are going to collaborate. It's not even um, a, a big point of discussion anymore. It is done as a team. It is done with various perspectives and various opportunities. Um, we also we, we need to see that we are addressing the needs of our students. In our school, <coughs> we have a number of languages that are spoken at home. and um, about one third of our students are not English language um, speakers or native speakers. And so when we have an opportunity here to um, make them feel valued for that language that they already possess and then have them in addition learn English, um, we need to go away from a defi deficit thinking. Um, uh, deficit thinking is basically uh, we are seeing the fact that a student is an English language learner as a deficit. And yet we know as global educators, multiple languages do a whole lot of things to our brain, allow us to develop uh, a, a number of perspectives and, and other things that are very valuable. And so we need to think about the assets. We need to make sure that we have a positive perspective and that we understand that our students do not just need immediate information. They will need skills for the future. They will need skills of flexibility, agility, world languages. They will need uh, uh, all kinds of opportunities. And we really have to uh, decide what it is. But I cannot decide what is important for your school, and you cannot decide what is important for my school. Uh, we have to take these other uh, parts of, of the equation into, into account. And finally, the role of social justice and equity. Um, when we ask what do our students need in today's environment, um, and I'm specifically addressing the, the events that have recently shaped our nation. Um, it is extremely difficult. My personal perspective is that our work has just tripled. Um, that is what um, uh, the first impression is, simply because we want to make sure that we understand what is really happening. Um, we need to think about the framework within which we are working. We need to ask ourselves, are we continuing the social reproduction? Are we looking at the powers that are impacting us politically, economically, social, cultural? I mean, these are all different, different factors that are impacting our decision. And we cannot, we must have a, a multidimensional uh, approach to that. We must have a, a 
we need to have all 10 lanes of the freeway open and, and, and drive up the, on them simultaneously. We cannot just say, this is what our students need and look only at the economics or only at the political climate, or only at the cultural needs. Um, so this is very important for us that we have an understanding of the various uh, factors that impact uh, our decisions. So for us at this particular school, we had the opportunity to review uh, and, and really make an inventory of who we are, the 90 years of history. Uh, the um, the traditions of our school, the demographics, um, the parents, the desires, the needs of our students. We had to take all of this into consideration. We then had to go about and really um, address the mission statement, the vision statement, the philosophy of what we're doing. And we don't have all the answers. Um, at this point, we have some really good core beliefs that are uh, rather general because we don't want to lock ourselves into something that we'll have to adjust in a few years time again. One of the important factors that um, uh, impacted us is the fact that we have uh, experiences from around the world. Our faculty is um, uh, very gifted in terms of their life experiences and the knowledge that they bring with themselves. And so it's important that we value that and that we really uh, use that. And the transformation that we have uh, embarked upon is not concluded at this time. We continue to grow. We continue to look at uh, innovation. Uh, we've worked, as I mentioned before, with a number of universities doing research, um, looking at the structure of our school, looking at uh, giving voice to the student government, uh, looking at um, the resources we currently have. And for us as a, as a private or parochial school, um, actually we don't have a lot of resources. Um, we need to uh, ensure that we can get all the title funding that we are entitled to within our um, local network. Uh, we also have to make sure that we um, get all the resources that are already present in our community. Um, but Overall, we don't have a huge support in terms of funds available to just go about and, and present new programs. Uh, we are tuition funded. So that is a reality that um, we need to take into account when we talk about the system. Uh, we need to understand that we are serving and that our mission is to serve students from all socioeconomic levels. And so we are making sure that we are using all the financial resources that are available through uh, federal programs. Uh, we need to make sure that we use all the resources within our community. We had a number of um, community leaders who either joined our, our consultative board or who were on a task force um, who assisted us with their specific professional expertise. Um, and that took us a long time. We are only now at the point where we feel that we have had um, uh, we have we've had an opportunity to um, to see where we're going and to now in detail start to work out on uh, on on what the plan is for this journey. Um, a lot of it has been done through research, literally three years of research so far, um, and. It's important that we have an authentic support, that this is not something that is my agenda or the, the faculty's agenda or the parents' agenda. It needs to be a joint, uh, a joint need of our students, something that we've identified that is very authentic. Um, in our particular case, we feel that we, we do have that. Um, so for us, <laughs> the climbing has just begun. Uh, we are now at a point where we are looking specifically at what does this mean at a curricular level. And um, for us, uh, that, that uh, uh, has an impact because um, we, we want to make sure that we understand how accelerating globalization is impacting our community. How do we make sure that 
within our community, we don't lose our identity? How do we make sure that um, globalization, which brings a lot of wonderful things, can also be threatening to the local community in terms of language, heritage, cultural heritage, or in terms of standardization of the norms, when really we need to look at a diverse knowledge base and life experiences that could contribute. I'm coming back to the asset-based perspective rather than a deficit uh, perspective. So we need to understand that. For us, it also means that we have to ask ourselves um, about our social justice agenda. As a Catholic school, we have an amazing leader um, in our Holy Father. And um, for us, the hands-on approach that Pope Francis has taken and his um, uh, being the shepherd, uh, showing the way, is uh, really has made a, a forceful impact on us as a Catholic and, and faith-filled uh, school. And uh, I, I dare to say that uh, our, our Pope has not just made an impact on, on Catholics. It, he has uh, been able to really um, ask that important question and, um, and really guide us to think ahead. Um, for us, besides our faithful perspectives, uh, we have also engaged in the sustainability question. And, and we have been very, very uh, blessed to have been able to collaborate with the global think tank um, at, uh, at Harvard and to have some guidance from, uh, from that process. Um, we are now aligning our, um, our perspective to ask how can we address those 17 uh, sustainability goals for 2030. What does that mean from a Catholic perspective? What does that mean from our local perspective? And for us here at our school, we have always um, indicated that local action is um, a global impact. And so as, as we start to conclude this session, um, I just want to remind ourselves how we started this reflection. Uh, it's an infusion of courage. It's the fact that we need to have different perspectives and agility and authenticity in this process. Uh, the formula and the story of our school is unlike any other school because we are not the same. We are not in the same locale. We are not in the same system. We are not in the same um, environment. And we each have to ask ourselves, who are we and what do our students need and how can we get there? And it's a very systematic approach. It has taken us much longer <laughs> than I initially thought. Um, it has been a very rewarding, um, a very rewarding uh, journey so far. But as I indicated, for us, the ascent has only begun. Uh, we are now going to dissect what that means at a curricular level. And uh, again, there are models that we can learn from. Uh, there are nations that we can learn from. There are, there are school systems we can learn from. Um, we are open with regards to that exchange of ideas. And I truly feel that as a global educator, uh, regardless of whether we are at the district level, at the school level, um, we have an obligation to do what is right for our students. And we need to ask some critical questions, even if they are uncomfortable. As Catholics, we have traditions. We have also a church history. And through the lens and the perspective that our new leader in the church has given us, we have to ask some critical questions. What is the right path? And um, again, for me, I, I'm enjoying the fact that um, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to lead our students, hopefully in the right direction. There are no guarantees. Um, it is a difficult journey, and I don't think that anyone has the ultimate answer. What is global education and what is it supposed to achieve? We each have to identify that, and we have to work together and collaborate. So I want to thank you for listening, and I'm more than happy to, um, to uh, address some of the questions you may have.
Are there any specific questions? I'm just trying to uh, quickly scroll through some of the chat. I hope that I'm uh, I'm being respectful here. I'm trying to see if there were any specific questions. Lucy or Steve, I hope that you can hear me. Are there any specific questions? You're welcome. Thank you for um, for listening. Thank you for sharing. Um, if you need to reach me, I think my address and information, my contact information, is um, um, available at the at the conference uh, under the speakers. And I hope that this has been um, at least a little bit helpful in terms of reflecting. And I appreciate it. So thank you very very much. Hi again, everyone. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, walk away. I um, was talking to somebody in another room that set up. Uh, any questions that we have before? Are we okay here? Um, any questions that people want to um, ask? If you want to ask in the chat right now, um, we'd love to answer them. Uh, yes. Um, I'm looking through them. If you can repeat them, Peggy would help me because I had to step away for a second. Here. Or raise your hand, Chloe. Do you want to? Do you want to? I'll give you the microphone, and you can um, you can ask on the microphone. Well, I'll, I'll press the talk button. Hello. Yes, uh, thank you yes, for your hi. wonderful presentation. Hello? You're welcome. Yes, okay, you're welcome. Uh, How can I help you? Okay, I have a question. Um, I just like to know if your school has a kind of a long-term program of having um, an exchange program with other schools in other parts of the world. I'm a teacher at a school called TMM Girls School in Uganda, East Africa. And I know that uh, many schools do have kind of, they, they kind of link up with other schools in other parts of the world. I find a very valuable way of, um, right. you know, exchanging different ideas, different cultures, building relationships across continents, uh, you know, learning from each other. So I'm wondering whether your school has that kind of program. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, is your name Cole? 
<laughs> Jolly, Jolly, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, Jolly, thank you very much for asking uh, this beautiful question because this is something that um, is part of our strategic plan is we have to look at our means of communication. Um, and uh, part of it is the fact that it has to happen virtually. For us as a school, we are a small school. As I said, we have limited resources and we have very young children, yet we need to create opportunities for them to connect. And to connect globally, definitely, um, you know, the digital world has something to do with that. So we actually, in our plan right now, have made sure that we have the infrastructure to, from a technology point of view. It took us a long time um, to make sure we have the bandwidth, we have the uh, digital infrastructure. And actually, right now, we are in the process of getting additional digital tools in order to be able to link up with other schools. I have already, uh, actually, just from my background, I have a network of schools waiting to connect with us. But I had um, recently the visit of one of the um, religious sisters who came from Kenya, uh, but who had also uh, been working in Uganda and, um, and other parts of Africa. And um, we already made a decision that as soon as we can, we will actually start to have that collaboration happen. We have not decided yet as a faculty if, let's say, certain classes or grades are taking certain continents to connect with, or if we leave it open and com completely autonomous to the teacher to decide what is best. Um, but we are going to try and integrate some of the sustainability discussion uh, on those 17 goals. Um, we need to talk about climate change. We need to talk about um, what it means as a human being to be impacting the environment. We need to talk to each other about uh, water sources. Um, here in California right now, we are experiencing a drought. And uh, we're not the only country or not the only place. Um, so uh, there are certain things that we can connect with. We need to um, take away the differences that separate us and look at the commonality. I always believe that as human beings, we share 95% of the common concerns and maybe 5% of differences that are local or life experiences. Um, so I think there are so great opportunities. Thank you for asking. And I invite anyone who has an interest to go ahead and connect with us so that when we are ready, we can do so. I know the time zones um, are not always convenient, but I do believe that um, even, uh, you know, using a flipped classroom or um, doing some creative uh, organizing, taping of videos of students and so on, that those are opportunities that definitely happen. And for us, we are very blessed that we are actually going to have an assembly hall um, where we will be able to connect globally so that when there are world events happening, um, it is important for us as a, as a school to also address the fact that we have students at multiple levels. And they need to uh, get across that age bridge as well. So older students have to sit with younger students and mentor them and explain to them what is going on. So um, thank you for asking. Yes, I think this is uh, very, very important that we really start to think outside of the box and make the connections that are necessary. And sometimes we have to start small. It may be one or two connections yeah, what I would before add you to know this. it. It's I, I think that there are a lot of schools that want to connect um, and, what ha or, and teachers who want to connect with other classrooms. And they're always looking for the perfect partnership and, you know, the way to make things happen. And from watching a lot of this over the years, I would say that um, I think when you can have some sort of connection um, outside of just a pen pal exchange or something that's kind of artificially set up, that it helps. So like, for instance, we found um, we had two people who met in, in the chat rooms at this conference five years ago, five or six years ago, uh, Pedro and Will. Uh, Pedro is a teacher in, in Mexico City and Will is a teacher in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the U.S. And they started having a conversation in one of these chat rooms, and it led to collaborations very organically. So I think, you know, having a context and developing a relationship with um, a person or a school that's going to follow through is really, really important. 
And what I like about your school, BHA, is that you are being thoughtful and intentional about it. You're not rushing into it and saying, let's collaborate. You're, you're waiting till you get all your ducks in a row, so to speak. Um, you're getting everything organized and ready, and, and you're being very thoughtful and yes. intentional. Now, that said, well, and just one more thing, and then I'll, I'll, then I'll shut up. Um, the other thing I want to say is if, you, if anybody wants to continue to collaborate post-conference, in our website, we have a discussion forum, and, and people are welcome to put out requests for anything there. I don't know how busy it will be after the conference, but mm -hmm. whenever you want to do any kind of partnership or collaboration with someone, it's really important to be really specific about what you expect and what you want to do, and, and so that there's no misconceptions and there's reasonable expectations of whomever is participating. So that's the only thing I would add to that, too. Right, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, Lucy. Sorry for that. Um, I, I just wanted to add that for us, it's not just, you know, we want to do this. We also have some things that really impede that. Um, when you have young students here in, in our system, in our school system, we have all these paperwork that need to be signed that we can use the child's image that, you know, that they, because this is a, the World Wide Web and um, we, we realize that there are dangers associated with that, with that as well. So we have to be super protective, particularly of our younger students. It's a little bit different when you're at the high school level. But there are certain things here that, are, that prevent us from being as free as we would like to be, even if we have vetted schools um, uh, that, you know, that we feel very comfortable. And I, I think you have such a valid point, Lucy, by saying that it has to be a relationship. It can't just be, you know, something superficial because that's not going to last. But if you have a relationship with another school or another person or another classroom or a student that you've worked with for or over time, that's the valuable, that's where the exchange really happens and that's where the sharing of knowledge happens. Uh, and I think that's, that's really what we're trying to achieve. Um, yes, I'm, and I'm actually not a patient person, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so this has been this has been way too long in the in the making. But I realize in 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 hindsight that uh, trying slowly has actually benefited us because I think we have gotten if not if not some elements, at least a few elements uh, that that have built a solid foundation for us to grow and to sustain this. Can you also talk to us a little bit about how do we grow more leaders who have a mindset like you, who are strategic thinkers and planners? Um, you know, I was I was back at when you were showing off some of the the kind of the strategies that you or the the buckets that you have to think about. Um, I was asking the audience here, you know, how do we develop leaders that have this this skill? Set uh, because I think it requires a certain amount of sophistication and thoughtfulness. So, any ideas on that? I, I'm a strong believer in tapping into existing talents and gifts. So, um, one of the things is uh, this is only my fourth year here at this particular school, and one of the first things I did is really try to value the knowledge that is existing and building on that. And I think um, as, as human beings, we have to be very careful not to assume, not to, um, not to judge uh, what we are given uh, to work with because it's important that we realize someone who maybe has had years of understanding of the school that we are in, uh, that is knowledge and uh, understanding that we will need at some point. Um, so, for example, for our 90th anniversary, we had to go back and really do uh, ask people, what do you know about the school? How was it? What can you tell us? And to value that, um, not to judge it, uh, but to integrate that into the overall formula and to build on it. So when we looked at it, there were two things um, that, for example, in, in, in our particular case that, that helped us. One was we looked at who were the sisters that founded us. Well, they came from Belgium. Uh, in the 1920s, that was a very interesting story, actually. Uh, they were global nomads there. Talk about courage. Talk about, you know, uh, moving from one country to another at that stage. And if you think about the political climate and everything else that was going on at that time. Um, so they were global nomads. They, were, they had courage. 
and they went ahead and built something that has lasted 90 years. Um, and we are using that as part of our DNA. It's part of who we are as a school. Um, another, another aspect was the fact that St. Augustine, who is our patron saint, um, was a global nomad himself as well. Um, he was born in uh, North Africa, what is today uh, North Africa. And um, when we think about that, this is our patron saint, and what did he have to go through? Uh, the few miles that he uh, traveled uh, through the Mediterranean were, were a world journey at his time. So again, uh, going back to that and looking and saying, this is not something new. We are not inventing a new idea here. People have moved. People have shared. People have learned all along through history. And we just need to remember that this is a positive value that we cannot um, push down experiences that are different from us, that we cannot diminish the, the knowledge that uh, may conflict with our own perspective, but that we need to stop and think, and is there something there that we're sharing? So I think um, for us, as a school right now, we are a little bit in a leadership position within the Archdiocese. We are pushing forward with this. Uh, we were actually asked to continue with our research, and um, uh, we are hoping that this is contagious enough that we are not going to be the only school that thinks that way. But I'm hoping that sometime down the road, when we have our ducks in line here, that um, I can support other uh, leaders, young leaders, uh, that I can support young teachers. Um, I also feel very strongly that there needs to be some autonomy as to what is happening in the classroom. If I, as an administrator, micromanage and say this is how it's taught, I'm not giving the teacher the opportunity or the faculty the opportunity to unfold their gifts and talents. Um, they may be very technology driven or they may be very, they may have a very historical perspective or they may have uh, a number of assets there that, that we need to, and talents that we need to really uh, allow them to use. And I think the authenticity it boils down to I think that's a perfect way to end. And if everyone, if, um, if you want to go back to your slide with your contact information, um, maybe that would be also a good place to end too so that people can follow up with you and get in touch with you after the presentation. Um, I'm so glad you told your story and, and I think we're going to be looking to follow you as you, um, as you go through you know, the next step. And um, and I hope this is inspiration to any principal anywhere that you can do this and you can do it thoughtfully and intentionally um, and have the best interest of your learners in mind. So thank you so much for sharing and I hope that others in the room will follow up with you and uh, they can contact you. Um, I guess you don't have your contact information. BAT is in the is in our community, so you can search for her there and contact her through her profile page as well. Um, any any last words before we go? No, just uh, thank you so much. I am I am um, intimidated by by um, by being able to share that. Uh, I'm humbled by uh, I'm, I'm sure the the other educators who have more knowledge than myself. But I just want to say we need to have courage and we need to work together as global educators. Uh, we have much work to do. And I think we do it together. It's not, we can't be isolated because we're going to be, I think, thoroughly depressed if we, <laughs> if we, uh, if we don't. So um, everybody has something to contribute to this. <laughs> and another thing I want to say too before we wrap up, it was lovely to meet you at the Global Education Forum and if anybody here is in the U.S. and has the ability to travel to Philadelphia, uh, this is a face-to-face -face conference that takes place every autumn and um, it's, you know, virtual is great, it's better than nothing, but actually meeting people in person is, is pretty wonderful and it was, I'm so glad that you came up to me and introduced yourself to me. So. Anyway, thank you. Have a great day, everyone, and uh, we'll thank see you at the so next set of sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much.